Hi, everyone, and thank you all for being here this evening. I'm Alex Giannini from the Westport Library, and I'm really excited for tonight's program with Ross King. Before I introduce our guests, though, a quick word. If you have a question for Ross, please use the Q&A feature below us, and we'll do our best to get to it tonight. And now on to the show. Ross King is the best-selling author of books on Italian, French, and Canadian art and history. Among his works are Brunelleschi's Dome, Michelangelo and the Pope's Ceiling, The Judgment of Paris, Leonardo and the Last Supper, and Mad Enchantment. Claude Monet and the Painting of the Water Lilies. Ross's newest book, the subject of four years of research and writing, marks his return to the golden age of 15th century Florence. The bookseller of Florence tells the remarkable true story of one of the unsung heroes of the Italian Renaissance, the manuscript dealer Vespasiano da Bestici. Known as the king of the world's booksellers, Vespasiano produced hundreds of exquisite manuscripts for the libraries of many of Europe's most famous and powerful personalities. He reached the height of his powers as Europe's most expert and prolific merchant of knowledge when a new technology, the printing press, crossed into Italy from Germany, forever changing how books were produced and knowledge transmitted. The bookseller of Florence has been hailed as a profoundly engaging study of a time when books were considered essential to a meaningful life and knowledge and wisdom were cherished as ends in themselves and as a spectacular life of the book trades renaissance man. So please everyone join me in welcoming Ross King. Take it away, Ross. Thanks so much, Alex. Um, it's great to be with you. Um, it'd be even greater if I could be in Westport with you because um, as I was telling Alex uh, beforehand, I've uh, been on numerous occasions. I have very good friends who, until they moved about five or six years ago, lived in Westport. So I used to go up uh, to see them frequently. And I even did an event probably in about 2005, six, seven, something like that at the, uh, the Westport Library. Uh, so now I return virtually um, and I'm going to talk to you um, about uh, my new book, um, Bookseller of Florence, um, which um, has just recently come out. Um, and um, Alex gave a, a very good um, precy of it. Um, and what I'm going to do is talk about it for probably about 15 minutes or so. Um, and then I'm going to, which is mainly going to be an excuse to show you some images um, of, of Vespasiano's books and of Vespasiano and some of his friends. Um, and then um, Alex and I are going to be in conversation and he'll interview me on stage as it were. Um, and so I'll, just to introduce the book, one thing I'll say about it is that it is the title, the, I had the title um, before I even wrote a word of the book, almost before I started the research. Um, and I like the title because of the fact that it could be the title of a novel, uh, but this isn't a novel, this is nonfiction, everything's true. And if it's not true, I'm not the one who made it up. It was someone who was myth-making 500 years ago who made it up. Um, but uh, the other thing I like about it is it's a slightly estranging title, uh, because when we think of Florence, we probably, especially Florence in the 1400s, uh, we think of uh, painters and sculptors and architects and you know, people that I've written about, uh, Filippo Brunelleschi, who built the Dome of the Cathedral, Leonardo da Vinci, uh, Michelangelo, um, and uh, these sort of heroic figures from the world of sculpture, architecture, and painting. Um, in fact, uh, just last week, I gave a, a talk for a group of grade sevens um, in California on, on Brunelleschi because they were doing Renaissance heroes. Um, and, so, and some of them were doing Brunelleschi as their hero. Uh, but none of them uh, was uh, yet doing Vespasiano as a hero because I think um, uh, there, there's another Florence, uh, uh, the world of the booksellers, the world of manuscripts, the world of scholars and ink-stained scribes that perhaps um, these days get much less attention than these show-stopping artists uh, who've created gigantic monuments and um, iconic paintings and statuary. But for a long time, I've wanted to tell the story of these ink-stained wretches, the, uh, these bookish people, these bookworms who blew the dust off a thousand years of history by going into old libraries and recovering ancient manuscripts, rediscovering works that have been lost for many centuries um, and studying them and reproducing them, disseminating them and spreading knowledge 
um, and in that way, really creating the sort of world that we inhabit today. I mean, there's this wonderful irony that the world was made new by people who looked back at the past. Um, and one of the uh, features, uh, or one of the characters who I write about to some extent in the book is Petrarch, the great uh, 14th century uh, scholar and poet who's been called the first modern man. He was called that in the 19th century, but he and he's still modern to us. Uh, but he was modern not because he cast his gaze towards the future so much as that he looked to the, the past um, and the way the ancient Romans had done things. And so it was the story of these people that I wanted to tell. The, the time when Florence was known as Athens on the Arno, um, because it was as famous for its philosophers, its translators, its scholars, its poets, its men of letters, these literary figures, and its booksellers like Vespasiano, as it was for its painters and sculptors. Um, and at the end of the uh, century in 1492, one, one of these great scholars, Marsilio Ficino, who was a great Plato scholar, great translator of Plato, and probably still 500 years later is one of the top three um, Plato scholars there has ever been. Uh, so Ficino was um, a brilliant scholar and he looked, cast his eye back over the previous decades, the previous century, uh, which for him was the Florentine century. It was the century of Florence. Um, and he talked about how this century, like a golden age, has restored to light the liberal arts, which were almost extinct, grammar, poetry, rhetoric. And then he goes on painting sculpture, architecture, music, and this ancient saying of songs to the Orphic lyre. And all of this, he says, happened in Florence. And in many ways, that's true. I mean, what he does say, he allows for the fact that certain things have happened across the Alps that were quite interesting. But for him, it's within the bounds of this small city of some 40, 45,000 people that all of this has happened, especially Ficino is, is saying um, intellectual products. And Ficino was a big part of that because you could argue that the greatest intellectual achievement of the 1400s was the rediscovery of Plato. We now think of Plato, A. N. Whitehead, the British philosopher, talked about Plato being, uh, the, or all philosophy being a series of footnotes to Plato. And yet in 1400, almost Plato was virtually unknown in the West, but he was rediscovered in Florence thanks to people like Marsilio Ficino. I mean, so all of this is happening this time, this wonderful mix of intellectuals. We're also, of course, mixing with the artists and architects. They all, I mean, look how small the city is. They all know each other. Um, and so I wanted to tell the story. And the question is, how do I tell it? Um, who is my vehicle? Who is the agent that I can use? Is it going to be Ficino? Is it going to be one of these other figures? Um, but uh, quickly, I settled upon this guy, Vespasiano da Bistici, um, who you do come across as you read Florentine history, the 1400s, because he was in many ways the great Florentine historian of that time, thanks to a series of biographies he wrote, Lives of Illustrious Men and One Woman. He wrote about Lives of Illustrious Men of the uh, 15th century. But the epithet usually attached to him is Cosimo de' Medici's favorite bookseller. That's what historians who write about him these days call him. Uh, but in fact, he was called because of the fact that he was Cosimo de' Medici's favorite bookseller. But I was intrigued by that. I mean, what did it mean to be a bookseller in Florence in the middle part of the 1400s? And you know, what were books like? What books was Cosimo de' Medici buying? What was the process of creating a book? Um, and so I was sort of interested in that manuscript culture uh, that Florence excelled at at that time. Um, but I also discovered that Vespasiano is a, in many ways a bigger story than just the Florentine one because um, he was known as the king of the world's booksellers. Um, he was the biggest merchant of knowledge uh, in the 1400s, or at least the first half of the 1400s before the printing press is invented and, uh, and books are distributed much more widely than even Vespasiano was able to do. Uh, but he was someone who became uh, the, the key person to creating libraries all across Europe. 
Um, if you were a, um, a sort of potentate who wanted to grace his palazzo with a library to uh, you know, show what, uh, what a man of wealth and taste you are, uh, you would hire Vespasiano to get you 500 manuscripts and he would either buy them, find them from somewhere, or he would create them anew. I mean, so I realized this is, I mean, he's an interesting figure in his own right, but he also knew absolutely everyone. Uh, and I realized he, Vespasiano was someone who can bring this whole story together for me. Um, and so I started looking, looking into his life um, and the way in which he developed as, um, as a bookseller, how he became a bookseller. Uh, because he was, he, he started at age 11. He started young. Um, Florence had child labor back in those days. And so Vespasiano, at the, his father died when he was four um, and in 1426. And so Vespasiano had to go and earn a crust of bread for his mother and her six siblings or six children. Um, and so Vespasiano went to work in the street of booksellers. Um, and I've got a couple of images here to show you where this is. If you've been to Florence, <clears throat> you I mean, this will look very familiar to you. We're looking north. We're sort of hovering above the Arno at this point, um, or the Arno is just behind us. We have the cathedral, with the magnificent dome. We have the baptistry, um, and we have the town hall here. Um, and then we have this street, which if you've been to Florence, you probably walked up because of the fact that you've been to this building, the Bargello. Um, the street signs today, which is the great sculpture museum, of course, um, the street signs today say it's called the Via del Proconsolo. But in those days, in the 1400s, it was the Via dei Libri, the street of booksellers. Um, and um, uh, the shop that Vespasiano went to work in, in 40, early 1434, at the age of 11, uh, was that of Michele Guarducci, Guarducci uh, a bookseller was known as a cartolaio, which was a reference to the carta or paper uh, that he sold, but he provided many more services than that. Um, and, but this is where the shop was. So it's very central in Florence. It's almost midway um, between the cathedral and the town hall. And it's in the, the heart of intellectual Florence. Because the interesting thing about the bookshop is that, which is it's not the building still exists, but today it's a pizza parlor. And so you can buy a pizza there um, or get a plate of spaghetti or fettuccine, um, but uh, you can't buy books there now, alas. Uh, but this is where he was, and it was in a location known as Sul Canto del Palaggio, which in the uh, Florentine dialect meant on the corner by the palazzo, be, palazzo being the Bargello, which in those days was the palace of the chief magistrate. And so this became the intellectual center of Florence right here. And Vespasiano went to work um, as a, um, you know, probably working behind the till initially, um, binding books, things like that, because the, the booksellers provided all sorts of services in those days. They sold new and used books. Uh, they uh, were book binders. They sold paper and parchment. You could come, they were really publishers because you could come to them and say, I've written a book. Uh, can you find me a scribe and have it copied out? Make three copies of it for me, please. But ultimately under Vespasiano, this, when he took over the shop, uh, it became an intellectual center. It was a, a, a kind of reading room, debating society uh, where uh, intellectual luminaries in Florence and any visiting dignitaries would gather there and have debates about philosophy and religion, also politics, things like that. And it also became um, a, a place where gossip and information were exchanged. And as I describe in the book, Vespasiano took advantage of the fact that he was tapped into this network of people to ultimately become a spy. Um, and you know, it, it was a kind of listening post for, uh, uh, for, uh, for information about the anti-Medici faction, the pro-Medici faction in Florence and so forth. Um, and so uh, Vespasiano um, went to work probably initially as a book binder, um, which would have been very hard physical labor, uh, but then ultimately he got involved in the creation of books, uh, getting the parchment from the parchmenter who was just down the street, uh, which was scraped to a 10th of a millimeter thick. Um, he would then hire a scribe and a scribe would 
copy it in, in beautiful script onto the parchment. Uh, Vespasiano's clientele, for the most part, were very high end. They were the 1% in Italy or in Europe at that time. Um, and so these were luxurious manuscripts that cost, um, say, 50 florins, 60 florins, uh, which was basically a year's salary for uh, the average worker in Florence. The average wool worker probably got 50 uh, florins per year. And that's what a book like this um, edition of Cicero uh, created uh, by Vespasiano uh, for one of his English clients. He, as I said, had them all across Europe. And he did this for William Gray, who ultimately became Bishop of Ely. And you can see how beautiful the writing is and how legible it is, uh, because you don't have to know Latin to be able to figure out uh, what this means. And I discuss in the book this shift in handwriting from go the Gothic script of earlier centuries to this much more legible one that we recognize today, because all, all of our books are created in a kind of imitation of this script. So when the printing press came to Italy um, in the uh, 1460s, a, a decade or so after Gutenberg had invented it um, in Mainz, uh, the, the printers realized that for our, uh, in, uh, for our Italian clientele, we need to make books that are not in Gothic script, but rather in this beautiful legible type that uh, these scribes have been using for the previous few decades in Florence. Um, and so um, I'll, I'll just say a couple of words about the decoration of them uh, because they're illuminated, in other words, decorated with a uh, gold and silver leaf. Uh, we can see the gold leaf is on here, uh, pounded to one three hundred thousandth of an inch um, by a gold beater. Vespasiano would go to the gold beater um, and buy the gold leaf and then give that to his illuminator um, who would apply it um, uh, to, uh, to the page. And then it would be painted uh, using often very expensive pigments. Uh, gold was not nearly as expensive as ultramarine blue because of the fact this was pounded so thinly. You could take a, a, a piece of gold the size of a sugar cube and hammer it uh, between ox intestines um, and ultimately make a piece as big as, uh, say, your living room floor. Um, so it was beaten so thinly that it was, it was very flyaway material, um, and it wasn't actually that expensive by the time you were working on it on this level. Ultramarine blue, though, was very expensive. It came from beyond the seas, ult, ult, uh, ultramare. Um, it came from Afghanistan, the Hindu Kush mountains in northeastern Afghanistan was the um, sole uh, supply in those days of lapis lazuli, the beautiful blue stone that's used to make it. Um, and almost as expensive was the yellow dots that we see applied to the ultramarine, ultramarine blue. And that is uh, saffron, which comes from crocuses. Uh, and it uh, takes 4,000 crocuses to make a single uh, ounce of saffron. And so Vespasiano was creating these beautiful manuscripts for illustrious clients, uh, three generations of the Medici family, not just Cosimo, but also his sons, Piero and Giovanni, uh, who were even greater collectors than Cosimo. Piero's son, Lorenzo the Magnificent, he also worked for, he worked for various popes, including Nicholas V, the first Renaissance Pope, as he's known, um, who is, uh, or who was a very good friend of Vespasiano's. The two of them were very close. They were for three generations of the kings of Naples. Um, and then various warlords uh, throughout Italy. Um, he worked for Alessandro Sforza, was a great book collector. Sadly, his entire library was lost early in the 16th century when it burned, uh, probably burning up hundreds and hundreds of manuscripts that Vespasiano had created for him. Um, and all sorts of other important client, uh, clients uh, he had. Many of them were enemies of each other, as you can probably imagine. And there was one moment in the summer of 1469 when um, four of Vespasiano's best clients, including Borso d'Este uh, and Alessandro Sforza on one side, were fighting Duke Alfonso of Calabria and the man who was Vespasiano's greatest client of all, the Duke of Urbino. Uh, all, all four of them met on the battlefield. And Vespasiano must have been slightly anxious for 
the future of his enterprises because of the fact that presumably uh, all of them could have been killed um, or maimed in some way, uh, but all lived to fight another day. And then also, also crucially to, uh, to, to buy more books from him. And I talk about the creation of the library for the Duke of Urbino, uh, which Vespasiano modestly called the finest library since antiquity. And he said a printed book would be ashamed uh, to show its face among uh, these marvelous books that uh, he had created, some 900 of them uh, for the Duke of Urbino. And so that's sort of an introduction uh, to how I got started uh, on the book um, and I just wanted to give you um, a little indication of what these manuscripts looked like and the sort of effort and expense that went into the creation of them. Um, and so we may come back to some of these things and I'm, um, as uh, we said, uh, please feel free to send uh, questions to us, but I'll stop, uh, stop sharing at present um, and, uh, and talk to Alex now. Thank you so much, Ross. I appreciate that. <clears throat> um, I uh, I was actually texting my, my colleague Jennifer uh, while you're talking. We were both saying how much we nerded out <laughs> while reading your book. <laughs> so uh, I've got a bunch of questions for you, and I I, I want to start. So the book itself is is a book about books and bookmakers, booksellers, but it's also about the evolution of culture and the acquisition of knowledge. Um, so I guess with that as our start. Can you talk a little bit about the backdrop of the book? Because I find that so incredibly fascinating where you have in Florence, you have the Duomo's nearing its completion, the modern world's coming into view, all of the key figures are kind of gathering in the city. Um, but you've got this stark contrast between a city with 70% literacy rate and you know these men, the, the, the good men speaking well, or at least trying to, uh, with, and you contrast that with what's going on in the rest of the world. These are violent times, correct? Yes. Yeah, well, that's one of the, in many ways, the sad ironies of this. Um, the, the, the Florentines had a dream. Um, many people in Italy, maybe many people in Europe had this dream of making their world better uh, because we have to look at the century that had just passed. If you made it to the year 1400 and you would look back at the wreckage of the 1300s, um, there's a, some of you might know uh, a very interesting book, very famous book that was probably published, I think, in the late 70s, maybe early 80s, uh, by Bar Barbara Tuchman, The Distant Mirror, uh, which has the subtitle, very accurate subtitle, uh, The uh, Turbulent 14th Century. Uh, and it was a turbulent century, not least because of the Black Death of 1347 to 49, uh, but also because of the fact that the Hundred Years' War started at that time. And um, it was, the times were extremely violent. The papacy had abandoned Rome in 1309 and gone to Avignon. Um, and when it went back in the 1370s to Rome, um, it then migrated back, or at least one Pope migrated back uh, to Avignon and another popped up then to replace him in Rome. And you had two Popes. Um, and then ultimately from 1410 to 1417, three Popes, one, the third one in Pisa. And so the world really was a mess um, as people looked at, um, you know, they'd had famine, they'd had plague, they, the church had failed them, uh, their own political leaders had failed them. And so they began asking themselves, what can we do to, to improve ourselves, uh, to, uh, to come out of the, the problems that we're having? And their answer was uh, to look back at, to look at the past uh, and say that the most successful society on earth had been that of ancient Rome. Some people said the Roman Republic, some people said the Roman Empire, but nevertheless, Rome was the locus of the kind of ideal of what a citizen, uh, citizenship uh, and leadership uh, could do. Um, and, and so they wanted to get the blueprint, the template or the playbook for how to, um, you know, how to become a good leader, how to give a good speech, how to educate children, um, how, how to study, uh, how to become a good friend, uh, how to enjoy life, all of these things, these reflections from the ancient world they wanted to find. And so that began this, I think, very heroic project uh, that I alluded to of people going to um, monasteries, uh, monastery libraries, and sort of pulling 
books down off the shelves or pulling them out of cupboards um, and looking at them and, and finding something, a work by Quintilian on the education of an orator or, or um, a work by Cicero um, on republicanism. Works like this, they thought can teach us how to become better people and how to make our city uh, or our dukedom, our princedom, whatever, how, it, how to make it a much more successful um, entity. And the sad irony then is that they wanted to do this so desperately, but the people who did it, it has to be said, many of the people at the forefront in the avant-garde of this movement were not the good man speaking well, which is what they profess to want to create. And I think this is what we would say we want from our politicians and political leaders or civic leaders. We want the good man or woman speaking well, uh, someone who uses their wisdom and eloquence for good. Uh, but these people, most of these people ultimately use their wisdom and eloquence and they had that in abundance, they used it for, for ill all too often. Um, and so we get these very grisly characters. Mm. Um, we almost get a kind of Renaissance type in the 1400s, maybe an Italian type in particular of someone, and Federico de Montefeltro mm. is a good example, someone who is, um, ex is very extremely learned, uh, you know, reads books, very cultured, loves books, loves art, uh, speaks Latin, maybe even knows some Greek, um, is relig very religious, pious, and yet is also um, absolutely savage, um, murderously savage. I mean, Federico de Montefeltro was, was known as the stormer of cities. Mm -hmm. um, he was the greatest soldier of the age. Um, so you, you have this combination of the best of humanity in him, um, at, but also in some ways the worst of humanity. And you see this again and again in these characters, which might've been bad for th their society ultimately, uh, but I have to say it made for great reading for me and great writing. Uh, to be able to uh, sort of look look at these uh, larger than life characters, very interesting characters who um, didn't quite practice what they preached. Mm -hmm. Oh, I mean, and, and there are a bunch of points that I want to circle back to, but but in terms of the characters who kind of walk in and out of the book, the three popes, you have the vagrant pope showing up in Florence at one point and kind of just being a pope, but <laughs> not really. Yes, yes. And 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 I mean this, the book is is filled obviously with with just really interesting characters. So I, maybe if we if we uh, let's focus on the main character here, Vespasiano. So he is he becomes um, de Medici's favorite bookseller and and this master of uh, of of the booksellers. But he comes from humble beginnings and quite a bit of family debt. So how does he get to the street of booksellers? In many ways, that's a mystery, and that that's something we'll probably ne you know never find out because of the fact that whatever documentation there might have been has been lost. And Vespasiano never mentions it, but it's such a mystery because of the fact that he, at the age of 11, he goes to work in a bookshop. At the age of 11, he could just have had five or six years of education, probably very little Latin. Um, and, uh, but he goes into a bookshop and within a decade or certainly within 12 years, by the time he's in his mid twenties, He's a recognized expert around Italy at this time and ultimately around Europe, a recognized expert in manuscripts and in ancient literature. And I quote a letter uh, from 1446 when Vespasiano was 24 years old of uh, uh, an abbot in Arezzo, south of uh, Florence, um, who wants to get a copy of an ancient Roman work, one of the most famous works ever written in ancient Rome, uh, Pliny the Elder's Natural History. Pliny was the one um, who died in 79 AD um, because of Vesuvius uh, when he went on a kind of rescue mission uh, and also a scientific investigation. And his uh, natural history was a massive uh, uh, work of, of on ev basically everything that was known to, it was encyclopedic. Um, and so in order to understand this work, you had to um, know the 250 some manuscripts that existed um, in 1446 of Pliny's natural history and judge which is the best one if you want to make a get a copy made from and if you want your own copy of Pliny the Elder um, you have to find a manuscript and, and have it copied and so this abbot is sort of debating about 
how do I find the best copy of this? And he said, Or Vespasiano is the best guide for such things. And so within a, well, say, let's say a dozen years of entering the book trade, Vespasiano is this renowned expert in a, with extremely specialized knowledge. So the question is, why did he end up in the bookshop at, at age 11? Did he say, um, mom, I want to go work in that bookshop uh, across the bridge um, and down the street? Or did the bookseller, did Guarducci somehow um, meet him and counter him and realize he was very bright? Did his teacher uh, recommend him? Uh, because of the fact that I think what we can safely say is Vespasiano uh, was both uh, extremely brilliant and also very charming uh, because he managed to maintain long friendships with very difficult type A personalities. Um, and, uh, and, but he also had this incredible knowledge that he was willing to um, put to use for their benefit. Uh, so yeah, he's a fascinating character, but there, there is that mystery at the heart of how exactly this happened. In some ways you can, maybe we have to think of him as a Leonardo da Vinci character. And maybe I should have had that as a strap line. I should have called him the uh, Leonardo of, of manuscripts or the, mm -hmm. the Michelangelo of manuscripts. Because in Leonardo's case as well, we don't know how on earth this kid from Vinci uh, became such a great artist and such a great thinker and experimenter. Um, and likewise, Vespasiano, who's born 30 years earlier than Leonardo. Um, and incidentally, Leonardo's father was Vespasiano's lawyer. Uh, Leonardo's father was a very prominent notary in Florence and he worked for Vespasiano and their offices, in fact, um, his office was about three doors down from Vespasiano's bookshop. Um, anyway, I'm digressing, but the point yeah. is that, um, uh, you know, rather like Leonardo da Vinci, Vespasiano is one of these geniuses who come, arrives in Florence at the right time. Florence allows him to become Vespasiano. Leonardo da Vinci in another city may not have been allowed to become Leonardo da Vinci. Um, it was this sort of unique set of circumstances in Florence that allowed these people to um, become the best that they were able to be. So Vespasiano flourished in this intellectual environment of Florence in the middle decades of the 1400s. I think as he gets older, it, it's even, I mean, there's a, he has to be cunning as well, because he's really traversing the political machinations of, of Italy, right? And, and it's kind of amazing he doesn't get himself killed. Well, one of my favorite stories is, yeah, I mean, at some points he uh, could have run into trouble. Um, he was very good friends with uh, an ambassador uh, from the King of Naples, King Ferdinand. Um, and he knew Ferdinand well, and he knew this ambassador well, but the ambassador was an absolutely bloodthirsty character. Um, and it, it, Vespasiano was giving information about Florence and to, King Ferdinand, and Ferdinand is thanking him for it um, in letters that have survived. Um, and uh, Vespasiano could have been seen as a traitor to the Florentine Republic because of that, um, and, and a traitor to the Medici. And one of my favorite moments in the book uh, is in uh, 1478, uh, when Vespasiano has created his masterwork of all the manuscripts he produced. And you know, it's, it's difficult to know how, you know, just how many there might have been because so many of them have been lost in, in wars and especially in fires. Um, but his magnum opus was the Urbino Bible that he did for Federico de Montefeltro, a two volume illuminated Bible, uh, which is now in the Vatican Library. Um, and he finished it in 1478 after having his scribes and illuminators work on it for two years. And Federigo was desperate to get his hand on this treasure. But unfortunately, the timing was exquisitely bad because Federigo de Montefeltro at that moment in 1478 was the bitter enemy of Lorenzo de' Medici. And um, Federigo then thought, I mean, Federigo had actually tried to kill Lorenzo um, and he was poised outside the city with his troops ready to storm Florence. The storm of cities looked like he was going to invade Florence. Uh, but he began to wonder what's going to happen to my Bible. Is Lorenzo going to let me have it? And so there was almost a kind of truce or ceasefire um, as Federigo contacted Vespasiano and Vespasiano contacted Lorenzo. And Lorenzo, to his credit, said, yes, you can send the Bible to 
uh, Federigo. Um, and that's what happened. And Federigo then wrote to Lorenzo a letter saying, um, Vespasiano made everything possible and uh, thank you for allowing the, the book to come through. And when, my, when my editor read the, that passage, you wrote in the margin that this was like the Christmas truce in 1914 when the uh, Germans and the allies play, um, play soccer in no man's land when they come out of their trenches briefly before they going back, go back to shooting at each other. And that's what happened. The Urbino Bible uh, went to Federigo's library and then the fighting resumed. It's the book that- So you're right, he, he was playing both sides. Games. Yeah, it's the, it's the book that held back a thousand swords, swords for a little while, at least. Yes. Um, all right, so just to, to jump back to, um, in your presentation, you talked about the scribes that he had in his like network of scribes, and he had 40, right? So I guess the, my, my first question is an obvious one. How does he identify these people? And then if you could talk about, my favorite, I think everyone's favorite is the, uh, the hermit scribe, because I, I think that's yes, just yes. an unbelievable story. Yes, and yeah, he was literally a hermit, um, and he lived in a cave in uh, Fiesole, or just outside Fiesole, which some of you might know, it's just to the north of Florence, sort of uh, going up the hill. Um, and Vespasiano would take the, uh, you know, the book that he wanted copied uh, to, to the hermit, um, and then presumably come back a few weeks or a few months later to collect it. But this, the crucial thing is about this hermit um, is that he was extremely educated, as most of Vespasiano scribes were, uh, because he had studied at the Sorbonne. So he'd gone off, he was Italian, he was from the area, and he went and studied in Paris, and then he um, became a hermit. He'd entered holy orders, uh, I mean, he, he then just came and lived in a cave. And Vespasiano uh, uh, used him for a lot of his work. Well, one of Vespasiano's other scribes, worked in a similar kind of confinement, but it wasn't quite as voluntary because he worked in prison. Mm. We don't know much about him. Uh, the only thing that's known is at the end of the manuscript, they would often copy. Um, and I think we can understand why they'd want to do this. After copying hundreds of pages, they would write a comment about themselves at the end, um, you know, putting, putting their name or uh, putting the date on which they finished and sometimes putting something about the times. You know, these are times of warfare or these are good times the duke of milan is attacking us etc they would put things like this and and this scribe put that he was working on the book in jail uh, so he was in um involuntarily he was a hermit involuntarily but when we think of scribes uh you know in the uh, the pre printing press era we probably think of uh of people, monks and friars uh, hunched in monastery, in monasteries in scriptoria, uh, which were the rooms set aside for copying manuscripts. And that's a fair assessment or a fair um, characterization of them in the Middle Ages, uh, say up to the 12 and maybe into the 1300s. But by the 1300s, things begin to change. And in fact, most of Vespasiano's scribes were notaries people who were trained in the law, uh, which gave them two crucial things. They didn't need their knowledge of statute law or anything like that very much. But what they did need to have to be ascribed was a knowledge of Latin because most of the books, the vast majority uh, were copied, were, were in Latin. Um, but they also needed then to have uh, good handwriting um, and notaries had good handwriting. They trained in penmanship. Um, some of Vespasiano's scribes were, like the hermit, uh, were religious figures. Uh, one of his other favorite scribes was a priest named Piero Strozzi. Um, and there's a nice story about him where uh, Vespasiano goes to see Pope Nicholas V, who, as I said, was a very good friend of, of Vespasiano's. Uh, before he became Pope, he was a great scholar named Tommaso Parentucelli. Um, and Tommaso and Vespasiano were great friends. Tommaso then becomes Pope Nicholas V. Vespasiano goes to Rome to see him, um, and you know they uh, have a discussion together. And, and Nicholas says, basically, I'm Pope now. What can I do for you? And Vespasiano says, for me, nothing, uh, or at least this is what he tells us. He says, for me, nothing, but I do have a friend, one of my scribes, um, who's a priest who doesn't have a parish. Um, and can you do something for him? Um, and, and so Nicholas, uh, out of respect for v Vespasiano, uh, got him a parish just outside of Florence. 
And besides, besides doing his priestly duties, this man, Father Piero Strozzi, also copy, continued to copy manuscripts for Vespasiano. Hmm. So what Vespasiano looked for in short were, you know, good handwriting, knowledge of Latin, but crucially an education. Hmm. Uh, because what he liked about Piero Strozzi, the priest, was the fact that he, Vespasi, Vespasiano said he's the best corrector of texts. In other words, if he's copying out a text that's 100 years old or 200 years old, he can spot a mistake made in that by the scribe, the previous scribe, and he will then correct it. And Vespasiano became known for having manuscripts that were extremely accurate, um, where whatever errors had been in the uh, copy text uh, were created, and therefore he uh, made a, a much better copy than any of the previous ones. So there was that form of quality control that he exercised. He, I mean, he seems like he was just a sponge because the the um, the Florence that he walks into has prominent uh, book collectors. One and one standout for me in the book is is the book collector Nikolai, who takes a, a great interest in him. Um, and so, I, a couple of questions: if, if you talk about Nikolai a little bit, and then what like what would his collection physically look like at that time? Yes, it uh, is a, a really uh, fascinating character. And if we, um, just to introduce him, one of the questions about Vespasiano then is how do you go from an 11-year-old you know, with a bookseller, Guarducci, who's not especially distinguished. Mm -hmm. um, he was not a great figure among the humanists and philosophers in Florence. Uh, so there were these other figures who came into Vespasiano's life very early. Um, most of whom were book collectors and all of whom were highly educated. Uh, and one was a cardinal named Cesarini mm -hmm. um, and uh, Vespasiano came to know him very well. Uh, and the other, I think, great er early influence on him uh, was this uh, really fascinating character, Niccolo Niccoli, who um, was, uh, had the greatest private collection of manuscripts in Europe at this time, probably the biggest collection of manuscripts uh, at this point was the Sorbonne in Paris, mm. uh, which had around probably, and, and this number is gonna seem really low, uh, 1500 manuscripts. And Nicoli had um, 800, mm. uh, which as I said, was the largest private collection in Europe, which tells us something about the scarcity of mm. books in those days um, and the scarcity of them and also the expense of them. Right. Nicoli was very wealthy but he spent all of his money on books, all of his disposable income on books, and ultimately went into debt, of, you know, financing the purchase of 800 of these manuscripts. So what they would have looked like, Nicolai had them in his palazzo. He had a, um, a, a palazzo very near the Medici palazzo. He was a friend of Cosimo de' Medici, um, and um, he would have kept them. They wouldn't have been like, um, if you can see the books behind me on the shelves, they would not have been kept like that on shelves, Nicoli almost certainly would have had them lying flat. So they would have been um, lying on benches and they just would have been sitting flat um, like, like this um, on, um, on a bench. Uh, and he might've had some of them chained to the bench to make sure that no one walked off with them. Uh, and they would have been big, uh, you know, many of them hundreds and hundreds of pages of parchment, extremely heavy. Um, I mean, there are uh, some of the books from the period that it, you know, almost takes two people in order to lift. Um, and so, uh, uh, yes, Nicoli was one of these crucial figures in the education of Vespasiano. He was someone who gave him um, uh, knowledge um, and literally gave him books because Vespasiano describes how he would be invited to Nicoli's house and he would go in and find that there were eight or 10 other people sitting around reading. And Nicoli would then give Vespasiano a book and say, sit and read. And after an hour or so, everyone would put, lay the manuscript aside and they would begin talking about what they'd read. It was sort of an early book group and or discussion group. Uh, and uh, so Vespasiano was um, edu certainly educated that way. One of the, one of the real, uh, maybe, uh... The mystifying part to me is how Nicoli seemed to know where to look. He not that he left Florence, but he would send people to find books. How could he know where the books would be? 
Yeah, it's, I guess he knew a little bit about history mm. <clears throat> because let's, I mean, if we cast ourselves back to say the first decade of the 1400s, a decade or so before Vespasiano was born, when there were a lot of great discoveries, mm. um, you would think if you're looking for Quintilian, um, who was uh, who lived in the first century AD, the second half of the first century AD, and was a, a teacher of rhetoric in Rome, a great educator, the, the most famous teacher of uh, mm. rhetoric in Imperial Rome. Um, if you want to get a copy of Quintilian's work, where would you look for it? Um, and we would think, I think, well, Rome, how about looking in Rome or maybe in Florence or somewhere like that. Uh, but in fact, Italy, uh, the, that was the legacy of the ancient Romans left Italy uh, with the Lombard invasions. The Lombards turned up in the sixth century AD after the fall of Rome, um, uh, fall of the Roman Empire in the Western 476 AD. A century or so later, after the bar endless barbarian invasions, the Lombards come. And unlike previous barbarians, they stay. Um, and as one scholar said at the time, all the educated men fled Italy. And they went with their books to places like Ireland, uh, Scotland, England. Um, and then from there, I mean, there's this wonderful migration of knowledge, uh, which goes someone like Quintilian, his work would have gone from Italy to Ireland or Scotland. And then it would have gone with a mission, an Anglo-Saxon missionary or an Irish missionary to Northern France or Germany to educate the barbarians, um, to educate these barbarian Germans um, and to teach them. And then it would have ended up in, it would have been copied various times, and it would have ended up then in a library in northern France, uh, maybe northern Italy, uh, but then especially in somewhere in Germany. <clears throat> and Nicoli somehow knew that that's where um, knowledge was uh, going to be uncovered. Mm -hmm. And so whenever one of his friends was going away on business, often papal business, as his friend Cardinal Cesarini mm -hmm. often did, someone was going up north of the Alps, and Nicoli would say, here's a list. He would give them a list of monasteries and say, look at this one, check out the library here. And that's what they did, um, including another figure who was, I think, crucial in the education of Vespasiano, uh, Poggio Bracciolini, who was probably the one of the two or three greatest of the manuscript hunters, these sort of Indiana right Jones figures right. that existed yep. at that time, who were archaeologists of knowledge. And Poggio Bracciolini went to uh, the monastery of uh, St. Gallen in what is today Switzerland um, and made discoveries, found Quintilian, for example, found a, a whole and complete copy of Quintilian in that library. And he went to that library because Nicoli told him to go there. Um, and so uh, Vespasiano then comes into the story because he is the one who more than anyone else begins disseminating this knowledge um, and turning it into new manuscripts, taking manuscripts that are a century or two centuries or five centuries old and reproducing them um, in new parchment and new fresh ink and new style of handwriting um, and sending them to England, uh, sending them to Hungary, sending them to France, sending them all around Italy. And so we have this sort of explosion of knowledge occurring at that time. And you mentioned Poggio, and and um, I can't remember him or or uh, Nikolai said that that basically his discovery in the monastery was was bringing a wise man back to life, and that that was the kind of the for me it, it was it, books are knowledge, but also books are people at this point. I mean, you were you were breathing life into into the dead here. That's right. There, it's a and that that sort of idea of looking at. Uh, the authors as much as the works of art and having a kind of personal con connection uh, between across the centuries uh, between the people in the, the 15th century and the ancient Roman authors uh, really begins with Petrarch in, in the 14th century uh, because Petrarch uh, found a number of works of Cicero uh, in places like Liège in Belgium. Um, also, he found some in Verona. Uh, some some of uh, Cicero's letters, um, and uh, you know if you know if you like to f try to find a moment where uh, where the Renaissance begins or when attitudes change, uh, this pivotal moment. You might some of you might know the Virginia Woolf comment that, that where she says around 1910, 
human consciousness changed, um, and which is a kind of throwaway line. And people have tried to figure out what she meant by that uh, ever since. But for anyone who likes to find those moments when consciousness changes and things begin to change it, it's when um, Petrarch in Verona writes his own letter to Cicero uh, because he's been reading all of Cicero's letters and Cicero comes to life for him and Petrarch thinks I can now understand who this guy was and so he writes a letter to him and it's and, and there's this sort of you know the the distance uh, the 1400 years between Cicero and Petrarch telescope um, they, you know they shrink um, and so the, those centuries are spanned by this meeting of the two minds and Petrarch's admiration for him. But you're right, with Quintilian, um, it, 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 the discovery, it was probably the most widely celebrated discovery of the 1400s after um, Plato, um, because the ple complete works of Plato come to the West um, at this time in 1439. Uh, but previous to that, in 1416, when Poggio Bracciolini finds Quintilian, this is the work that people had searched for for decades, if not centuries. They knew of it. They had read fragments of it. They'd read ancient authors quoting it, but they wanted to get it for themselves. And Poggio then got it. He found the, um, you know, the golden fleece yeah. um, and brought it back, of course, to Florence. And so many um, of the books in that monastery were were eaten by worms, or, or right, and and this this was in good enough shape. He, so he he transcribes it himself, correct? That's or, right. Yes, or something like that. Yes, uh, the way he tells the story is he went into the monastery and he found a, a number of books, including a very important one, Vitruvius's Ten Books on Architecture, was which was the um own you know the the sole book from ancient Rome on architecture to survive. Um, but he, as he said, he knew that book already because there was a copy of it in Florence that it had been owned by Giovanni Boccaccio, mm -hmm. uh, the writer of the, the Decameron. Um, and that book was now in a library in Santo Spirito. Um, and, uh, and so he says, well, we thought we'd, it was a wasted journey. Uh, but then one of the monks said, well, there's also this tower uh, where we have some books if you want to go look there. Um, and so Poggio and his friends, the two companions he was with, went into the tower um, and, you know, it was full of spider webs and, um, and weeds and things like that and mold. Um, and they found these decaying books um, and Poggio, and, and according to Poggio, the three of them wept looking at it, saying that, you know, look at all the knowledge that's being lost right before our eyes here. But then, as he says, their tears of sorrow turned to ones of joy when they realized that they had a quintillion uh, that might have been falling apart but was also legible and so Pedro sat down and wrote out his own copy of it uh, so that that um, uh, you know it would continue uh, the no knowledge of quintillion would continue and it was widely celebrated uh, around Italy people wrote letters to to him saying exactly what you said Alex that you've resuscitated you've brought the dead back to life. You've um, made it possible so that we can live better and you've done um, uh, uh, something for all of humanity. Uh, and so, uh, you know, I mean, there's something endearing about this period in which they had this thirst for knowledge um, and this desire to uncover it and find it. Um, and then once they found it to disseminate it and share it. Well, it's, it's it, I mean, it's them discovering the world before them. I mean, it really is 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 um, so fascinating. And and I, I know we're kind of brushing up against eight o'clock, but I I, I do want to talk um, about the delegation from Constantinople that comes to Florence because you mentioned Plato. So right, this is kind of a and a way a big moment in 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 well in world history. Um, and lots of things change. The views of Plato change during this time, and also views of wealth change in Italy. Yes, they, <clears throat> what they discover in these books um, are, and one thing I'll say about all of these characters, including Niccolo Niccoli, is that they were devout and believing Christians. Petrarch was as well. Um, and, and Vespasiano certainly was. He was very pious. Um, however, they were excited by the fact that they found works of 
um, to tell them how to live in the here and now. Um, the church or the Bible or St. Augustine and St. Jerome could tell them how to prepare themselves for the hereafter. Uh, but what they needed um, after the 14th century, they needed someone to tell them how to live in the real world. Um, and that's what these works gave them. Um, and, um, you know, especially um, something like, uh, you know, the, the rediscovery of Plato uh, gave them an, uh, and, and gave them a sort of new view of, um, of what art could be, uh, because of what Plato wrote about artists, and it uh, gave them a new views about philosophy and living together. But as, I mean, one of my, I mean, I think one of the most interesting things that I discovered as I was writing was, as I alluded to earlier, you know, we take Plato for granted. And, you know, there, uh, there was the, you know, supposedly famous course that you would take in um, your first year of university, um, history from Plato to NATO. And, you know, everything begins with Plato. And um, yet he was a blank in the West uh, for really a thousand years um, after uh, the fall of the, um, the Roman Empire in the West, Plato had disappeared from Western consciousness. And he's recovered um, when we have this wonderful moment in Florence in 1439, for which we can thank Cosimo de' Medici, who paid for it to come to Florence. We have this wonderful moment of the meeting of the Greek and Latin churches, uh, the Orthodox Church and the Latin Church, the Roman Catholic Church, as they try to come together and iron out their differences um, in the face of the threat to the uh, to Constantinople, the seat of the uh, patriarch in the East, um, uh, come, come together in the, the threat against, against Constantinople, Constantinople from the Ottoman Turks. And of course, they didn't iron out their differences. Nothing came of that. Nothing still has come from that almost 600 years later. But what did come out of that um, was the fact that you had Greek scholars <coughs> from the East, because of course, Constantinople is Greek speaking at this time. Um, you had these scholars who came to Florence and the Florentines were the ones in Europe who could speak Greek. That's really what set them apart, or at least a few scholars in Florence could speak Greek and read Greek and were fascinated by Greek. Um, and so they, they loved Latin literature and the ancient Romans, but they knew that the ancient Romans philosophically deferred to the Greeks. And so they wanted to recover more knowledge of the Greeks. Um, and so they were hungry for, they saw all of these long bearded Greeks getting off, uh, you know, getting off the train, let us say, at Santa Maria in the Vela train station with their suitcases loaded with books. Um, and one of them came with uh, the complete works of Plato, all 36 dialogues. And at this time in the West, only four were known, four of 36, and those had been translated very badly and they did not have the original Greek. But that now arrived in Florence um, in 1439. And so that then, that's really the moment where Plato becomes resuscitated or he begins to come back. It's a labor of a number of decades, thanks to Ficino, the man I mentioned earlier. Uh, so yes, that's the way uh, things begin transpiring um, at that time at the Council of Florence. It had unintended consequences, but ones that arguably were greater even than the coming to get coming back together with the two churches. You also uh, have what's one of my other favorite people in the book is Plato, this latter day Plato. When he walks in, I, I mean, can you describe him? Because I, I, I just I, I was so taken by his appearance that you described, and just the I, you, you could picture him walking in, just I am the you know, the modern day Plato. Yes, yes, he is well because his name wasn't actually. Um, Plato, uh, P-L-E-T-H-O. His name, his name was George Gemistos, uh, but uh, you know, Gemistos meant full, and um, it, so he could then take its synonym, Plato, which means ample, um, and sort of through a switch turn himself into Plato. And for the Florentines in the um, in 1439, when Plato turned up. Um, in Florence with his long beard and his copy of Plato and all of his knowledge of Greek literature. Uh, the Florentines were mesmerized by him um, and he gave private lectures in 
at Palazzo in Florence and the Florentines, including, I would have to say Vespasiano, who would have been yeah. very young at that time, uh, but he knew, uh, you know, knew a lot of the principals who did go to the lectures at that time. And so it's entirely possible um, he went to hear these, or at least he heard about them from other people who were attending uh, that he was friends with. Um, but yes, uh, Plato is very interesting because he, and, and, you know, we lose sight of some of these strange religious theories that people had back then because Plato was, it was indifferent, a matter of indifference to him, um, whether the Greek and Latin churches got back together, uh, because he felt that the, the true God was Zeus. I mean, he was basically a pagan, a pagan philosopher. Um, and, you know, he really did appear to be someone from Periclean Athens, um, who had somehow come in a time machine across the centuries uh, to 15th century Florence. Um, and ultimately, he, it, 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 he lived to over 90. Um, and he now is in Florence because one of his, or, sorry, not in Florence, um, he's in Rimini, but one of his fans in Italy, um, a warlord named Sigismondo Malatesta, was such a fan, you know, became such a fan of Plato uh, that when he went on um, a mission to attack the Turks uh, on behalf of the church, um, uh, he ended up in Mistra and he thought, Mistra, that sounds very familiar. Um, uh, the, you know, is that where Plato was from? And he asked around and found out that Plato had, was buried there. He, he died maybe five years earlier. And so Sigismondo disinterred Plato and took his relics back to Rimini, where he put them in the Malatesta temple, this beautiful building uh, that he'd construct, that Sig Sigismondo had constructed um, uh, 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 for, for him, himself to lie in. But, you know, he, he shares his tomb space um, with uh, uh, Gamistus Plato. So I have... Um... Uh, an audience question that I'd like to take, and then I'd like to just circle back and and, and wrap up if that's okay. Sure. Um, so uh, the audience question: Did Vespasiano have any known connection to Lorenzo Valla? Um, sadly, no. Um, I managed to talk about Valla in the book. They must have known each other, uh, but I found no evidence of letters between um, uh, between and among them. But he does write about Valla. And I think he uh, certainly met him. Valla, uh, for anyone who um, doesn't know who he is, uh, was probably the, arguably the greatest scholar of that century, which is saying something considering uh, the number of heavyweight scholars, not just in Florence, but people like Nicholas of Cusa as well. Um, uh, but Valla uh, was, you know, you could almost say he was top of the heap in terms of just his intellectual firepower. And he's the one who, of course, his great claim to fame is that he uh, was the one who um, uh, proved that the donation of Constantine was a forgery. He was a great Latinist. He also knew Greek, uh, but he was a great Latin scholar. And he could tell reading this document, this is not uh, fourth century Latin. This is something that's been cobbled together by some moron many centuries later trying to justify uh, church ownership of, of, of lands across Italy. Um, and so, uh, and Valla also is one who made a commentary on the New Testament, which influenced Desiderius Erasmus of Rotterdam um, in the next century and led, Rotter, led, led, led Erasmus to begin his um, uh, translation, new translation of the Bible. Um, so I, I, I love Valla because he was such a, besides a great scholar, he was one of these people who was um, not a good man speaking well, uh, but in many ways a bad man speaking ill. I mean, he was a, a vicious, vicious character. You did not want to fall foul of him because he had a, a sharp tongue and an even sharper pen. Hmm. Um, and now to, to kind of to close it out with two questions about uh, uh, Vespasiano. In around 1440 or so, right, the Kindle arrives, and, and he's kind of at the height of his powers, and, and a decade and a half later, the Gutenberg Bible. So not how did it affect him, but how did he go about not letting it affect him in the moment? For the, for, for the first couple of decades, he was largely unaffected by it. So just to give a timeline, the, 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 we have an eyewitness account 
<clears throat> of uh, Gutenberg's Bible, the 42 line Bible being sold in Frankfurt at the fair, <clears throat> excuse me, in October of 1454. Uh, Gutenberg understandably wants to keep his technique a secret. Um, and so for the first decade after 1454, it's a closely guarded secret. And the only people printing books are ones with connections to Gutenberg's workshop. But finally, two of the people who were uh, connected with his workshop crossed the Alps and went into Italy and headed for Rome, initially for Subiaco, uh, just outside of Rome, um, where they went to a Benedictine monastery. So there's a 10 year time gap between the time that Gutenberg is printing in the 1450s, and then these two guys, Schweinem and Panartz, turn up in Subiaco and then in 14. 65 go to Rome. Um, but then there's a, a still more time lag because they print books, but they don't print a lot of them. Um, and ultimately, uh, a few other Germans come, but by the 1470s, they all start to go broke because they're overproducing. Um, and so Vespasiano really until the middle of the 1470s, the full 20 years after Gutenberg and after Gutenberg died in 1468, there wasn't really meaningful competition for him. And certainly his client base, Federico de Montefeltro, <clears throat> members of the Medici family, they did not want um, printed books. They wanted handcrafted, um, th they wanted the real thing. Uh, they wanted the scribal illustrated one. And of course, as I describe in the book, and as we show in some of the illustrations, a lot of these early printed books were hand decorated. Um, and in fact, you'd be hard pressed in some cases to tell the difference between them and a manuscript. And there's one story that Gutenberg at Frankfurt was trying to sell his Bible as the work of a scribe and not this miraculous machine uh, that he had invented and perfected a couple of years earlier. And so Vespasiano um, really had 20 years of grace before in the mid 1470s, the printing presses around Italy and also then in Florence really begin cranking things out. They find a way to make the economics work. I think what you have in the early part of that decade, 1471 to 72, is a kind of bubble that bursts where there are all these startup printers, most of whom are Germans, um, and they arrive on Italian soil and begin printing books printing versions of things that Vespasiano does, but they then all go broke. A few years later, they learn how to make it work. And that's when Vespasiano runs into trouble because in many ways his bread and butter starts being taken away from him. Um, and so ultimately, well, I, I don't want to ruin the ending of it or I don't want to give away the ending of the book, but Vespasiano then obviously has to do something to come to terms with what um, is going on in terms of intellectual uh, production uh, in Italy at this time. And uh, as the last question, uh, and maybe unfair because it is a big question, so apologies in advance, but can you talk a little bit about may, how, how does Vespasiano's outlook towards Florence, his city, his adopted city, go from, you know, what he walked into when he arrived to eventually, you know, what, what he thinks of it in, in his later years? It, I mean, in some ways, it, that's a sad story. Uh, Vespasiano, looking back, uh, one of the things I will tell you about him is what I've alluded to already. He becomes a writer at the end of his life, and he writes this series of biographies, which really turns into an intellectual history of 15th century Europe and also 15th century book collecting, because, of course, he was at the forefront of all of this. But when he writes about the age of Cosimo de' Medici, um, he calls him Cosimo of blessed memory. Mm -hmm. And he refers to this as a golden age. And this is his, his own youth. Um, it, this is a, a time uh, when he says there were people who valued books and valued knowledge um, and tried to put it into practice. But what he saw, ultimately he became disillusioned. And, um, and, and in some ways this, all of this knowledge that was being uncovered for him, he, I think he believed failed. Um, and because what he witnessed, 1478 is a turning point for him. That's the year in which there is the Pazzi conspiracy in Florence, which I alluded to, where Federico de Montefeltro tries to kill Lorenzo de Medici. And in fact, 
the conspirators killed Lorenzo's younger brother, Giuliano. Um, and, um, and then there's wholesale slaughter in Florence. And as, I as reprisals are carried out, and as I describe in the book, they were carried out literally on Vespasiano's doorstep. And so he would have come out of his, um, out of his shop to see bodies uh, swinging um, from the Bargello and heads on the door of the Bargello, um, things such as that. Um, and ultimately, I think maybe unsurprisingly, he became disillusioned with the sort of faction and violence that he saw not just in Florence, but also in Italy as a whole, and maybe even Europe beyond that. Um, and ultimately, he went back to, uh, so he condemned what he called uh, human learning, or he condemned um, sort of secular wisdom and almost repudiated the entire humanist project on which he had based his career. Um, and he really almost became an Old Testament prophet saying we must go back to the Bible. The Bible is the most important book for us. Um, and he made Bibles as well. He, um, just, the Urbino Bible, as I said, was his most important and famous uh, 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 and expensive manuscript. Um, but ultimately, I think he felt that all of this ancient knowledge was the light that failed because of the fact that people didn't improve. They had hopes that Quintilian would stop them slaughtering each other, but it didn't. Uh, what he saw everywhere he looked was a kind of um, sort of violent depravity uh, that really did, I think, depress him. And um, he regarded these things um, including various outbreaks of the plague. At this time, he regarded them as the punishment of God on a sinful people. Well, I think uh, I'm so thankful for you for obviously for being here and 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 for um, bringing to light the story of, I mean, like the, the river that runs through uh, Florence. I mean, uh, culture ran through the street of booksellers and, and really through this character who, who could have been lost to history. Um, so uh, it just... Ross, thank you so much, and I apologize for going over. I could talk to you all night, but uh, but I do want to thank you for for being here, and I want to thank everybody at home for being here. And please, if you haven't bought the bookseller of Florence, there's a link in the chat. Uh, we will ship it out uh, if you're not local. Uh, otherwise, you can pick it up at, at at the library. But please read it. It's one of those books I loved it, uh, and it's one of those books that I wanted to live in. So, Ross, thank you for for writing it, and thank you for being here. Um, Great. And My pleasure. Thanks so much, Alex. Thanks, everyone, for listening. Thank you, everybody. Have a good night. Stay safe. And we hope to see everybody in person soon. Good night, everyone. Take care. Thank you.